All right, welcome back. So here we are, we're in module two. Now, in this module, I want you to start coding. At a minimum, be in your IDE and playing with the code that I've got provided for you. Now, jump over here real quick and let's look at what we've got in module two before we talk about the nuts and bolts of C sharp. So we're dealing with data, data types, and the basics of coding. I'll deal with inputs and outputs as well. And um, I've got some supplemental stuff here. Oh, it's not even loaded yet, but I'll have some supplemental stuff in lectures for you. And the reading, what we're going to jump into as I walk through this. Resources outside of the course, that's your GitHub repo, repo that I've created for you that has resources, CS files that tie to the text itself. So stuff you see in the text, I've got CS files for you. So you can go grab it, pull it into your IDE, and play with it modify it. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm going to have tips, tricks, and insights available in any of the modules this semester. Uh, this being the first semester that I'm doing this redevelopment of the course, but they may be available in coming semesters. So this is just a place to go in and get some insights into what works, what doesn't work, what, what should I look out for, how much time is it going to take in this You've got a quiz tied to the concepts in the reading C sharp data data type concepts. There's an intro to C sharp in LinkedIn Learning. I'll talk about that here in a second. And then there's a follow up or reflection for this module, similar, almost identical to what you had in module one. You'll have one of these in each module. So let's talk about this assignment real quick before we jump into the nuts and bolts of it. You'll click on this LinkedIn Learning link. Everybody at the school has access to LinkedIn Learning for free. You'll go through it step by step and complete the LinkedIn Learning certificate associated with C Sharp at this link. I've got a video here how to complete the certificate, how to upload it, everything you need to do. And this is from a, another course that I teach, and it's a similar format, but the content doesn't matter. It's all about the process, how you go, about, go through doing it. Okay. So you'll get through it, obtain the certificate, and then you'll upload the certificate here. And due date will be down at the bottom of the assignment. Now, let's get back to where we were. And C Sharp Language Basics. So C Sharp, it's a derivation of the C language, but it's an object-oriented object version of it. It came about after C++. They are similar, but they do not use the same languages. They do not use the same syntax. And if you try to jump from one to the other, um, syntax-wise, they're different. You can't open the file extension for a .cs file in a .cpp environment. It's not, not going to work. It may let you open it, but it's not going to run. All right. So in C Sharp, some things I want you to be sure that you know. Right. We'll start out with, at the end of every statement is a semicolon. The statements are instructions to the system on how to process whatever we're trying to do. Each line or multiple lines can make up a statement. We're not limited to one line per statement. Some could overrun and they just flow over into the next line. Okay. 
You can't hit enter and then start typing on the next line. It doesn't work that way. There's an overflow process to get into multiple lines. Now, it's right here, the second statement. It says system.console.writeline. By doing that, you are explicitly referencing the system library and within it, console and everything, all the functionality within it. Now, at the beginning of your code, time we'll just say, yeah, I'm going to say using system. And by importing that system namespace, I don't have to say system.console. Okay. Now, I can dig even deeper in and use system.console and there's, there's syntax I don't know if we've got it in here but we'll see it further on down the road to not have to explicitly say console.writeline so when we use these libraries or these namespaces we have access to everything in there but we need to be explicit up top about what we're going to use and then we won't have to be explicit down in our lines of code. Okay, so at the top of your code you're going to have a number of things that you link to that are outside your code. And you're going to go through and you're going to create all your code and let's say here's the program that you want to create and in this program you've got what you're going to use you're going to import these resources or that namespace and within it we're drilling into everything about console and this console is your command line interface. That's what console is. So if you're wanting to use a command line interface to interact with the user, this is how we go about it. Console.writeline. So this write line writes to the console. Read line reads a line from the console or the command line. And if we're gonna write line, right here we invoke this feet and they've got spaces in here that I don't necessarily agree with having, but if it's an issue in your IDE, the IDE will let you know. So they've declared a method called feet to inches that receives an integer, and we'll call it feet inside the method, and it will return some value of an integer data type. So the argument that comes in feet well, the first time we invoke it it's 30 so we pass 30 in comes into feet and we store it in that variable location it's stored in memory as a integer data type it's in RAM and we get down to this next statement where we define another variable inches of the data type integer. It's an instance of the integer class. So I've got this inches object and we say take feet, multiply it by 12 and we're going to convert feet to inches. Return meaning pass back to wherever this was called the value stored in inches. So the right line statement, we're invoking this right line method. That allows us to print to the command line. What are we passing it? Whatever gets returned by feet to inches when we give it the argument of 30. Okay, that's it. The next one, we pass it 100. 
and it will display in a command line. The fact that it's displaying in a command line is because we've done this console.write line. This didn't receive anything from the user. Each one of these are statements ended by the semicolon. We've created a method. It passed some value over to or received some value. And we'll talk about it later on. We can set some default values to where if somebody called this method but didn't give it anything, eh, no worries. I've got a default value if you didn't give me anything. We'll deal with that when we deal with parameters. So it returns an integer. That's where that int comes from. And it's a fairly straightforward language. Now, when they talk about compilation or compilers, all right, the C Sharp compiler will take your code and it will transform it or convert it into an assembly. Now, an assembly, it's a way of packaging up whatever it is that you want to end up with when you've created your code. Now your code essentially is going to be one of two deliverables. Either one, it's going to be a library, something to be used in the future, or it's going to be an application, meaning it's going to be some file structure or some, I shouldn't say file structure, some application that sits on a device and when you want to use it, you just go start it up and it runs. Say .exe or whatever we're wanting to create. So we've got to have a compiler to convert our .cs file into something that will actually run. Now, From there, we'll go through and we'll deal with syntax and realize that in this language, which is different than Python, different than Java, but in some ways similar to both of them, we've got keywords, reserved words, that you just can't use. Um, we use what's called camel case to name our variables and there's a list of words you just can't use. Why? They already mean something. So using, it's reserved, you can't use it. Well, let me go ahead and put a little something in front of it and I can use it. So there are words that, we've got them listed here, they mean something, we can't use them, we're already doing something with those words. Now from there, we've got symbols that mean it, something. They mean something, and depending on where they're used, they may mean something different. The asterisk, multiplication operator or it could mean a wild card in some instances so depending on where we're at these things mean something and depending on the context will dictate what it means this symbol you think of it as oh that's the equal sign mm, no that is an assignment operator we're assigning some value to traditionally a variable or a constant. If we see that equal symbol twice, that is a comparison operator. So these symbols, depending on how they're set up, they mean different things. 
So when I say int x is equivalent to 3 semicolon, semicolon says I'm done talking. Int says the data type, or we're typecasting what x is going to be. So I'm saying, hey, I'm going to reserve someplace in memory following the rules set up in the integer class that dictate all the rules that I'll have to play by when I create this instance of an integer called x. And you know what? That space in RAM that I'm reserving for this x, go ahead and get this and put that value in there. Assign that value to that place in memory. That's how it works. We can have comments, multi-line comments, single-line comments. An integer is a whole number. Can I store a fractional number in a whole number? Variable. No. There's specific rules to how we go about things. So those rules that are built into the libraries that we're using are kind of like, let's say that there's a storage facility up the street from your house. Can you store whatever you want at that storage facility? I really doubt it. They have rules on what you can store store there. Can I store drugs there? Can I store, store uh, toxic chemicals, nuclear waste? Can I a herd of goats? Can I store a herd of goats in a storage unit? They've got rules on what you can store and how much space is reserved for the thing that you want to store. Hey, I want to store a car there. Okay, here's the spaces that we have available for cars. Here's the rules associated with storing a car on this property. Just how it works. So when I declared this integer x, the rules to the game when it comes to int, I need to know them because I have to go by those rules has to be a whole number. Uh, 2.5, can I put that in there? No, it's not a whole number. If you try to do something that violates the rules, it's going to say, hey, we got a problem here. You don't know the rules? Here's the rules. Now, there's workarounds, and we'll deal with them along the way, but the workarounds could be, all right, let me take this 12 times 30, that's going to end up with a whole number. Um, what if I had 12 times 30 divided by 0.3? That's going to be a fractional number. Maybe. So if I'm running the risk of it being a fractional number, I can do what's called typecasting. I can invoke a method that converts what I have when I pass it to that method, it converts it into another data type. It's called typecasting. So if I have an integer and I want to store it in a fractional data type, I typecast it. All right, it was 13, now it's 13.0. That'll work. Uh, it was 13.0. Typecast it to an integer. Now it's 13. I can do that. I can convert a string into an integer. As long as what's in that string is convertible. So there's, I can, there's tools available to me to do these things, but i got to know the rules to the game. So those are variables. Now we've got constants. I'm a firm believer, if we've got a constant, make it all caps. 
It's a constant integer y. Make it, make it a big y. It's not going to change. If something is the same, doesn't change in your code, make it a constant. If it's, let's say you were creating a retirement calculator and the retirement age is 65, make that a constant, set the value to 65, and then you just refer to that constant in your code. Because if at some point somebody says, you know what, we're gonna change the retirement age, it's not 65 anymore, now it's 67. You don't have to go rework all that code. All you have to do is change that value in the constant from 65 to 67. Make the change in one place, and it works seamlessly throughout. It's a whole lot easier than having to go find in your code all the places where you referred to retirement age as 65 as a static number. So, sometimes when we use quotation marks, it knows that we're dealing with a string. I still want to be explicit and say the data type is string. So I take what's here, I assign that value to message, data type string. That string class that I used to create this message object, that variable, it's technically a message object. That string class had some methods or functionalities associated with it that I can use that allow me to convert everything in message to upper, to lower, to sentence case. I mean, there's just so many things I can do using built-in methods. And then I signed it as uppercase or upper message. And then here's what would be printed. I took message from above, concatenated it, that's what that plus symbol does here. It adds two strings together. We call that concatenation. It's not addition. It combines them. So we take that message, connect it to what was defined as an integer. We typecasted that integer to a string. So we took that integer and said, you know what? Make it a string. It's that typecasting that I was talking about a little while ago. And then we just print out whatever message has. So we had message hello world, we added something to it, or let's say we concatenated, connected something to it. It's almost like uh, connecting a rail car to a train. They connected. Now we've got two cars together. What's in them? We'll store in message. So this typecasting it's a great thing for us to be able to use. We've got data type of Boolean. You should have dealt with this before in a previous course. We'll deal with classes where we're not only creating instances of predefined classes, but we will create our own classes. So we define it as being publicly accessible. It's a class and we'll call it unit converter. Within it, we declare some variable. We do not assign any value. We just reserve some spot in memory. How much space? Well, how much space is associated with an integer class? That's how much space we got reserved for whatever's going to go in ratio. Currently, there's nothing in it. We create a constructor for this class. And 
different languages will have the constructor set up a little bit different. In Python, you might have used an init or initializer. But these names will match the constructor and the class itself. They will match. It's public, so it's accessible from the outside. So when somebody says that they want to create an instance of unit converter, that essentially calls this method. And you can pass it some argument. Unit ratio comes in. Boom, there it goes. Now ratio has a value stored in it. Data types need to be the same, or we'll have to typecast. Just know what, what we're dealing with as we're going along. And then we'll create a method within our class called convert. And that convert method, we pass it some unit, and then we say multiply that conversion or the unit times the value stored in ratio and this convert method will then return that value that's an integer so unit has to be an integer we know ratio is an integer integer times integer integer so that's how we're going through this step by step. We need to know the types that we're dealing with, the data types that we're dealing with. We, we've got to know them and be ready for them. So there's a lot of planning that goes into everything that we're doing. Okay. With this, there's the arguments that were passed to that constructor and when we look at our code we say you know what we're going to create a new instance of the panda class and we're going to call it, call it p1 we're going to create another instance of the panda class we're going to call it panda2 each one was passed a different argument so each one became something a little bit different than the parent class as well as different than their sibling because these are both siblings they're children of the parent class so we now have p1 is an instance it's a class it's an object it's an instance of that initial panda class As we go through it, we've got, um, let's see here, console.writeline, panda.population, panda has a population, all right, so we declared it here, no value, no assignment in it, declared it, no assignment, constructor receives n, n was a string, String came in, name equals n, population equals population plus one. Now, population has no value. It was never initialized. There's a problem in this in that we never assigned some value to population. No default value that I see. I say, well, population equals population plus one. Well, what's in there? Nothing. All right, nothing plus one equals one. I would prefer that somebody said public static int population equals one or zero set it to zero they defined it but they didn't initialize it it's just me being me um, this would likely function but could throw an error because it 
was being used before it was initialized. So when it goes to see what's in population, there's nothing there. So the public keyword essentially means this thing's available outside, publicly available. Nothing's necessarily hidden. Um, in object-oriented programming, we encapsulate things and we can make them private. And that's to protect those objects or those values. And it makes our code more reliable when those things are protected. We let outside entities, people, users, whatever, access things that are public that are pretty benign. I don't have to worry about anything being broken or the thing not working anymore because all the things that are encapsulated or hidden, if you will, I don't want to say hidden, but encapsulated, protected, um, that's the stuff that's important. So I said, I'm going to use system. We're also saying we're going to use animals. Where's animals? Oh, it's something we defined. So we can create our own namespace. And in that namespace can be classes and things that we want to use over and over again. One of the things about object-oriented programming is we're going to create things that we can reuse over and over and over again. I don't have to rewrite this code. I've created it. And I'll just store it over here as a namespace. Now anytime I need it, I just need to reference it using animals. So once I've got animals, I can store that, just point to it. Now, we've got a main method, and in C Sharp, I'm going to say using system, so that allows us to use everything that's already built in. We've got a class, by default, we call it program, and in it we say static void main. So we create a main method. And this is what runs by default when you run your program. Depending on the language, this process changes. But for what we're doing in this course, here's what we're going to deal with for now. Static void main. It's not returning anything. So it's not int main, it's void. It's, there's nothing being returned. Right. Now, since it's the main, we need to have that static in there. It's going to stay the same every time. Um, let's see talked about types and doing some conversions. It should be something that you've dealt with in the past. Um, what they're talking about here in pointers is I can store a value or I can store I, I should say store um, I can reference somebody by as something by address or by value and the pointer is a whole lot smaller than letting somebody access the value, actually access what's in the variable. Um, back up again. When I reference something by a pointer, you know where to go get it. When I access something by value, the system essentially looks to see what's in there and gives you that value. It it doesn't you don't have 
access to it. You can't actually touch it. It's almost like you can look in through a window and you can see it, but you can't make it go away. And that's when we would deal with pointers and we're not going to deal with this so much in this class unless we're dealing with, let's say, um, strings or arrays. Let's say arrays. Right. Um, one of the things that I noted was in that one block of code, they didn't initiate initialize a value. I didn't assign any value to that, but they went to use it. And it would essentially be given a value of null. There's, there's nothing there. Um, okay. We've got a bunch of numeric data types in C Sharp. I just went through and did uh, a lecture for a course using Python and we talked about numeric data types I think we hit the three Python is such a lightweight really streamlined language whereas when we're talking about C sharp look what we got going on here <laughs> got a lot of different data types that we can deal with each one has a different amount of space associated with it and knowing that um, it takes up space in memory so I don't want to use something that reserves a whole lot of space in my RAM that I'm not going to use it ends up getting really expensive So I need to know the size associated with different data types, the difference between the different types of data types, how to, I can get the type and it'll tell me what the data type is for a specific variable. Um, I need to know, like I said, how much space is required for them. For each data type, each data type is a different class that I created an instance of. Like I said, those classes that I instantiated, there's rules associated with them. There's functions or methods associated with each one of those classes. Things I can do, all the built-ins that come along with what I inherited when I used it. Okay. So, in a nutshell, for most of this, know that we've got typecasting. Um, we can run into issues if we try to divide by zero, if we try to store an integer in, or store a, a decimal point in an integer storage location. Um, what we'll deal with at some point is ways to catch exceptions. Now, an exception is when things happen that we just didn't expect. Everything goes as planned, there's no worries, but there's exceptions that pop up, and we need to be able to catch them and handle them accordingly. And we'll deal with those later in the course, but essentially, if we're planning on bad things happening, great, I'm ready for it. And then when they do happen, I handled it. Now, the, the way I handle it could be however I want to handle it. I could throw up a message, I could shut the program down, whatever I want to do. But, nonetheless, I handled it. So we deal with different fractional data types, flow, double, decimal, 
Each one's different. Each one has different methods associated with it. Each one has different memory allocation. We've got conditional operators, and and or. This is a pair of pipes. That's the name of this character, is a pipe. It shift backslash will give you that character. Now we've got the and symbol. Both of those, and it's and. Both of those, or. They're conditional operators. Rainy or sunny. Could have been rainy and sunny. Not equivalent to. Now, the difference between a string and a character. Characters single quotes, strings double. Since we're explicit and we dictate what the data type is going to be, we avoid any kind of confusion that we may have when things are done implicitly, like may be the case in Python. We've got escape sequence characters that deal with new line and alert, null, whatever it may be to add those things in to our output or within our code. So the string data type is characters. The characters may appear as a number, but we still treat it as a character. It's a sequence of characters. Now we've got to be careful when we declare strings because of the characters that mean something special. So the backslash, we've got to be very cautious in how we go about setting up the syntax for assigning variables. Um, the the equivalency operator, which is a comparison operator, is saying, are two things equivalent? They're just comparing character by character. In C sharp, we have a built in array data type, and our initial index is zero when it goes all the way up to whatever the length is, minus one, for each character within that array. It's similar to a string, but the array has different rules or tools associated with it. Those methods for an array are not the same as the methods built into the string class. So when we declare these things, they're different. So this declared an array of characters. And the array itself is identified by those square braces. So in an array, we've got indices and a range. There's a range function. The range tells us what the starting point is, what the ending point is, and then we can go through and navigate from front to back how many items are in there. So if we started with an index of 0 to 99, that means we've got 100 items, or the length would be 100. The indices are the numeric representations of location in the sequence. It's a sequential structure. Um, an array is a data type, but it's also considered a data structure because it stores 
a data type within it. It's a sequential um, storage structure. Now, the indices, we always start programming at zero. If I was a mathematician, we would start at one. Depending on the textbook that you're using, when they talk about algorithms and the logic associated with programming, it's mind-boggling when they try to tell you, all right, we're going to start counting at one and not zero. But you go to write your code and you need to start the index at zero, not one. With this, we're starting with an index of zero. Or we've got our computer programmer hats on. So a one-dimensional array is what we're dealing with here, but we're not limited to just one-dimensional arrays. We can deal with multi-dimensional arrays, two, three-dimensional arrays, those we'll call matrices. So a multi-dimensional array is a matrix, or they're matrices. And a one-dimensional array, we call that a vector. So these matrices, or matrices, we navigate them with nested loops, one loop to go across and the other loop to go down or vice versa, depending on how we construct it. Here we're creating a multi-dimensional array see the brackets. We put the comma in there to indicate how many dimensions we're dealing with. So one comma means that we're splitting it into two dimensions. Two commas it would be three dimensions. Then within it our curly braces will show each of the rows in our matrix. And then we see the columns here. So we've got to be care careful about how we set that up and how we're navigating it when we nest our loops to access it. Now I talked about data structures. And up to now, you've probably not dealt with data structures. There's a few data structures you may have dealt with. You've dealt with an array. That's a data structure. It's also a data type. A dictionary. It's both a data structure and a data type. It's called a complex data type. We can use an array to create what's called a, another type of data structure, which is a stack. It has different rules associated with it. So when I said, hey, I've got an array and I've got rules that came along with my array class that I created an instance of. So when I create an instance of the array class and I call it um, salary array, it inherited all the methods and attributes associated with that parent class. Well, what if I wanted to make, make it something special? I wanted to make it a unique array. And the rules that I wanted to apply made it what we call a stack. When we think about stack, think about a stack of paper sitting on the desk in front of you. And if it's a stack of paper, how do you access the things in a stack of paper? Well, if we're formal about it, we don't sneak in and grab something out of the middle. You 
pop it off the top. So there's something on the top, you can just pop it off. If you add something to the stack, where do you put it? You put it on top. So the only way you can access things is from the top. You can't access it from the bottom, can't access it from the side. So those are the special rules to a data structure called a stack. A heap is similar but different. A heap's kind of like a bag. We just throw stuff in there. There's no real order to it. And when you want to find what you're looking for, you just got to start digging through it till you find it. And you reach in and you grab something different each time. There's no order to it. On a stack, well, the first one in is going to be the last one out. The first thing you put in the stack is on the bottom. And as you go access things, that first one in, that's the last one you get out. There's an order to that. So that's the difference between a stack and a heap. Okay. Um, okay. So we can pass arguments to methods, and we traditionally pass them by value, not by reference. We pass them by value, I say, here's what's over there. Here's what's stored in that location. If I passed it by reference, here's how to go look, and you go figure out what's over there, and whenever you need to go look in there, you can go look in there. But if you've got the reference to it, it's almost like having a key to somebody's house. You may not want to have that accessibility. So when we pass by reference or pass by value, I need to be real careful about how I go about things. And when passing by reference and passing by value, if I have something that has not the value stored in it, but the references stored in it, well, I'm letting somebody else get access to them. So passing by value and passing by reference, we'll talk more about it later. Something we've got to be real careful about, and depending on the data type we're dealing with, it's a big deal. So, we've got some arguments that we're dealing with ref and out. And passing by reference or passing by out we set that in the function call itself and that allows us to be cautious with whether we're passing it by reference or passing it by value So ref and out are both passed by reference. And we're being explicit about how we're doing it. And we're saying, hey, you want to know what's in there? Go look. It's right there. If I passed by value, I passed it some value. We had to say what it was to so the data type. We had to tell it what data type. When we look at ref and out, we don't see the data type. You find out, or the system finds out the data type when it goes and gets it. Here, we were explicit about it. We passed it by reference, and we said, hey, that's an integer. We wanted to make sure that it was an integer in our system.
We've also got the in parameter and we've got a params modifier. So I'll add in some supplemental on these because these are going to be new. I'm going to add a separate from about this point forward. I'm going to add a second video because a lot of this stuff is going to be new to you and I'm going to add in some code, walk through some code on it. And I'll record that next. Alright, so I'll put that video over in the lectures page and I'll post this video right where you found it. So look over in the lectures page for the next video coming behind this one.